This week, Starbase saw a lot of activity with the removal and scrapping of some of the original orbital tank farm, several starships getting shuffled around, and the last of the tents at the build site being taken down to make room for further expansion of the Star Factory building. All that and more this week at SpaceX. Friday saw Ship 28 lifted onto the turntable in the high bay. The bay's 180-ton capacity crane remained attached to S-28, as is normal whenever a ship is on the turntable. The old, unused water tank and one of the original methane tanks, which have been damaged by flight tests and static fires, were prepared for removal from the orbital tank farm. The first step was to attach the water tank to the 12-meter-wide shell load spreader. Construction of the latest phase of the Star Factory expansion continued at a good pace again this week, with columns and their interconnecting beams continuing to go up as the nose cone assembly hall pushes closer and closer to the ring yard gate into the build site. Making use of the three lifting hardpoints on the flight surface's leading edge and leeward surface, Starship 31's first aflap was installed in the high bay. The new facilities at Star Factory have now begun to produce vehicle assemblies. A booster liquid oxygen header tank was spotted inside the building shortly before it was brought outside. After being wheeled out of the building, the booster locks header tank was joined to a booster aft section that's currently under construction inside Star Factory. Back at the launch site, with the crane picking up the load, the unused water tank was cut out for removal from the orbital tank farm. Meanwhile, crews began to remove concrete from under test stand B at the former suborbital launch site to renew its surface for future static fire testing. Over at the build site, components of the Buckner LR-11000, which is being dismantled after finishing its part of construction on Mega Bay 2, were removed from the site. With the base cut away, the unused water tank was ready to be removed from the orbital tank farm. Carefully lifting the tank out from between the other tank shells, the LR-11000 placed the tank down in the cleared area near the highway for cutting. Ship 30 underwent a second cryo test at Massey's outpost, topping off the tanks with cryogenics for load verification testing. Crews were hard at work on Saturday morning, welding additional stringers onto Ship 26 at the top of the forward dome section and the base of the payload bay section. Once the former water tank was removed, scrapping began at the launch site. Holding the tank up by the top, sections were then cut away from the bottom and hauled away. Meanwhile, back at the build site, Rovercam spotted a second floor being added to one of the nose cone assembly stands in the new nose cone hall of the Star Factory expansion. The precise purpose of this stand is still unclear. Over in the rocket garden, workers began placing a third row of stringers on Ship 26 above the row of the base of the payload bay section. Back at the launch site, crews finished demolition of the water tank, repeating the earlier processes until they reached the tank's upper dome. The dome was detached from the crane and dismantled, clearing the way for removal of the next tank. The cryo tank shell load spreader was then attached to GSE-8 tank shell, which covers one of the designed methane tanks that was repurposed to a water tank and was the most heavily damaged. A few hours later, workers finished cutting through the shell's base and the GSE-8 cryo tank shell was removed from the orbital tank farm. A new stand and the lower half of an under construction nose cone were spotted inside Star Factory on Sunday as workers began to put the factory's equipment to use. A 9 meter load spreader for lifting the storage tank underneath the 12 meter shells was relocated to the launch site. Scrapping of the GSE 8 cryo tank shell was well underway by morning, and the damaged structure was quickly cut down for scrapping. Scrapping of the cryo tank shell continued through the day, with the second to the last barrel section cut out shortly after noon. The final cut was finished four hours later, and the cryo tank shell load spreader was switched for the inner tank load spreader. Back at the rocket garden, Ship 26 was staged for lift as workers strapped the lifting squid to the lifting hard points of the nose cone. The GSE-8 cryo tank was prepared for removal from the orbital tank farm, with crews working from lifts to attach the load spreader to the tank. The load spreader was still attached to the GSE-8 tank on Monday, as wind speeds reached over 70 miles per hour at Starbase and were obviously too high to safely perform the lift. 
the S26.1 skirt and the hot staging load head used to verify the engineering of the interstage structure under flight loads were relocated from the ring yard to Sanchez. It is not yet clear whether these are being scrapped or stored for reuse. Deliveries of Star Factory steel continued at the build site as construction moves towards the grounds of Tent 3. A set of steel support structures, possibly for new stands, was delivered to the build site. Dismantling of the Buckner LR11000 continued on Monday afternoon. The boom segments were taken out of the build site and driven towards Brownsville, a site that continued through the week as the crane bearing both SpaceX and Buckner livery left Starbase for an unknown destination. Taking a look at the current Star Factory construction, we can see that the new assembly hall is currently eight sections long and has supports running the whole length for a bridge crane. The heavy steel will be able to support heavy sub-assemblies like the nose cone or booster aft without any issues. Back at the launch site, glass and roofing material has been installed on the guardhouse bunker at the D1 entrance gate. Functional signage is going in, including the 15-foot clearance limit over the gate. Crews are hard at work running the plumbing for the new horizontal tanks at the orbital tank farm through the support frames. The teams of workers were cutting the remains of the cryo shell down to size, leaving them easy fodder for the bucket excavators. SpaceX's Massey Outpost continues to be a busy location as crews work hard to develop the testing facility. At the back of the site, work is underway on the foundations of what looks like it could be a flame trench for a new ship static fire station. Up towards the front, another crane was spotted drilling and installing new piles to prepare for an additional foundation near the structural testing stands. By Tuesday, more concrete was being placed for the Star Factory, preparing the way for still further expansion. Star Factory construction deliveries continued with the arrival of another bucket excavator and another load of structural steel. Over at the launch site, rebar was being placed for new construction over by the flame deflector tank farm. As plumbing work continues at the orbital tank farm, the pipe rack started receiving a fresh coat of paint. Several bags of Fondag were delivered to the launch site at the D2 gate. The fire and shock resistant material is expected to replace the demolished pad service under test stand B. Back at the build site, the LR-1750 crane at the Rocket Garden was disconnected from Ship 26 without ever lifting it to the engine installation stand. Meanwhile, at the orbital tank farm, the first dumpster load of scrapped cryo tank shell was hauled off. With the milled steel tank shell cleared away, the inner stainless steel tank was ready for removal. The methane tank turned water tank was quickly lifted off its mounts and placed into the scrapping area where crews soon got to work starting with the removal of the lower tank dome. Once the dome was removed, the tank was set down on its outer walls repeating the process seen with the cryo shell and water tank. Early in the evening, a third and extra large load of Fondag was delivered to the launch site, likely for the ship test stand pad. Just off Highway 4 and outside of the current SpaceX facilities, an equipment storage yard has popped up. Multiple pieces of construction equipment are making use of the grounds. Starship 31's second aft flap was installed in the high bay, completing assembly work on the ship's primary structures. With its current test campaign complete, Ship 30 departed Massey's and headed to the Rocket Garden. The multi-hour journey finished early on Wednesday morning, and the ship rolled up Remedios Avenue for its stay at the Garden. Over at the Ring Yard, the forward dome for the cancelled Starship 33 was finally taken to the Scrap Yard. Workers at the Orbital Tank Farm finished cutting down the GSE-8 tank overnight, and the load spreader was disconnected from SpaceX's LR-11000. Looking towards Mega Bay 1, work continues on the interior supports for the bay's new door. Structural steel work continued at the Star Factory, with the new beam connecting the columns together as concrete continues to be placed for the factory floor, with a steady stream of concrete trucks coming and going. Damaged siding was spotted below the windows of Mega Bay 2. The steel sheets that form the exterior wall of the building seem to have been pushed out from the inside. As the concrete work continued, the ninth roof spanning steel beam was lifted with the aid of a large lifting jig and workers on the lift secured the beam in place. 
At the other end, roofing steel and sheets continue to be installed, and towards tent three, workers have begun installing the next set of columns. The flat-bottomed 12-meter base of the removed water tank was taken out of the orbital tank farm. To speed the removal of the tank, the base had been cut off and left behind, making the scrap work lighter and easier to handle. A large electrical centrifugal pump, possibly for water, was delivered to the launch site and lifted by the LR-11000 and placed back near the spots where the vertical tanks were removed. Later in the evening, Ship 26 was once again staged next to the engine installation stand at Sanchez. With several starships in different stages of production, another round of ship shuffling began to move the vehicles between work stands, beginning with the removal of Ship 31 from the high bay. Over at the Massey outpost, Booster 12 began a round of cryotesting, filling the methane tank to the brim while leaving the liquid oxygen tank empty but pressurized for support. Demolition of Tent 3, the last of the original build site tents, began under the cover of darkness. On Thursday morning, Ship 30 was moved inside the high bay from the thrust simulator to a transport stand. A few hours later, Ship 30 was rolled out of the high bay, joining Ship 31 outside the ring yard for the next phase of the ship shuffle. Once outside, Ship 32 was brought onto Highway 4 before taking the turn onto Remedios Avenue and being set down in the Rocket Garden. With Ship 32 out of the way, Ship 30 was moved back into High Bay. Ship 31 was moved back into the High Bay about 50 minutes later, completing the ship shuffle as the final version 1 starships finish assembly and testing. Demonstrating the benefits of having a large on-site crane, SpaceX's LR-11000 lifted a small excavator into the pad area previously occupied by the vertical storage tanks. Working from the back wall, demolition of the tent began with removal of the interior liner and insulation followed by cutting and removal of the structural ribs. The Pathfinder nose cone that had been sitting in the ring yard was relocated behind High Bay, continuing the clean out that had been going on throughout the week. At the Massey's outpost, two vertical tanks that were recently barged back to Starbase from Florida have now been installed at the back of the site as it continues to be developed for engine testing. Demolition crews knocked down most of the remaining sections of Tent 3 in the evening, bringing down several rows at once. With the two most damaged tanks now demolished, SpaceX's LR-11000 was relocated to the area adjacent to the former test stand A. This week at the Cape, we saw Bob return to port with both fairing halves from the Off-Zone 3 mission, which launched on the 4th of January. After spending hours in port, Bob departed for Charleston Shipyard for maintenance. Recovery ship Doug headed to sea in the afternoon to support the Starlink Group 6-35 mission, which would launch on Sunday. The Starlink Group 6-35 mission successfully lifted off on Sunday evening on Booster 1067's 16th flight, carrying a payload of 23 satellites into orbit. Early on Monday morning, United Launch Alliance conducted the inaugural launch of its long-awaited Vulcan in its VC-2S configuration for the Peregrine 1 mission. The rocket performed flawlessly, sending the Peregrine landers precisely on target for the moon. Doug returned to port on Tuesday morning with both fairing halves from the Starlink G6-35 mission. Finishing their part in that same mission, Signet Warhorse 3 returned to port with a short fall of Gravitas and Falcon 9 Booster 1067 on Wednesday. The first New Glenn first stage booster rolled out of Blue Origin's factory, making its way towards Launch Complex 36 for integration testing. Falcon 9 Booster 1067 was lifted off of a short fall of Gravitas and placed onto the dockside stand in the evening. Signet Warhorse 3 towed a short fall of Gravitas out to sea for the Starlink Group 6-37 launch, scheduled for liftoff on January 13th. Doug set out later to support the same launch about 45 minutes later. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.